Thank you so much, Lee. I hope you can all hear me okay. You might be wondering why it looks like a horror movie here. I'm currently uh, in Kerala, India, uh, with my family, and um, there's been a power cut just a few minutes before coming on online, <laughs> which means, weirdly, the, the, the system preserves certain things like Wi-Fi, but allows other things to die like lights. So I currently have my phone light beaming in on me, which is why you have this effect. So don't be scared. Um, do imagine the best and not the worst for me in this context. Um, we are speaking about imagination today, after all. And it's a great pleasure to invite, well, to, to welcome you all here, first of all. Um, and this is now the fourth in our series of talks with Ian about the, the, um, the thing, the, ah, the matter with things. Um, I get confused with that because I wrote a book once myself called The Moves That Matter. And every so often, I, I the, the two books kind of flip in my head. <laughs> this is about the matter with things. And it's the fourth in our series. And we're particularly interested tonight to speak about imagination. Um, our prior event was more about sanity, prior to that about value, and prior to that um, matters of Ian's work more generally. Um, tonight, we've arranged a conversation with uh, Phoebe Tickell, whom I'm very pleased to introduce you, to you all. Many of you will know her already. Phoebe is, a, I'll give the formal definition before the informal one, a biologist, systems thinker, and founder of Moral Imaginations. It's an organization driving a movement of imagination-powered activism, placing life back at the center of the economy, politics, and systems of governance. Phoebe works across multiple societal contexts and has advised government, the education sector, and the food and farming sector. More recently, she has worked with Camden Council to train council officers in the skills of collective imagination and horizontal leadership. And um, Phoebe will speak a bit more about what all of that means. Um, but I can say that I know her personally. I was also part of a sort of imagination uh, practice that she did with a large group of people in Berlin a few years ago. So I have firsthand experience of how she evokes and elicits uh, sort of imagination in large groups of people um, for the greater good. And it's a practice that continue, continuing to develop and be refined as we go. Um, Phoebe is a scientist by background. And like Ian, they have in common this kind of... Uh, Deep, deep spirit of scientific inquiry leading you beyond science, which I think all the best scientists somehow, on the one hand, remain loyal to science and yet somehow move themselves beyond it as well. And I think they, they share that at the very least. I think the way I've seen this conversation in outline is that this is um, a chance for um, Ian, who's fascinated by imagination and makes it one of his main pathways to truth in the matter with things. Um, to, to speak with someone who's working very seriously and in a very dedicated way to bring imagination, to walk the talk of imagination in practice in civil society contexts, where we say we need greater imagination, but don't always know how to go about doing it. Phoebe's actually taking it very seriously and trying to do that. Um, and for Phoebe, it's a chance to get a rich, richer, more, more full theoretical take, take on what exactly imagination is and why. And I believe they're gonna explore many things, including moral imagination. Um, so it's a great pleasure to uh, let them speak to each other. And um, I can release you from the terror of this image of me with the, the light and the darkness. Um, I, will ho I hope to be back for the Q&A looking slightly more respectable. Um, but until then, I welcome the chance to introduce you to Phoebe Tickell and Ian McGilchrist, and I hope they'll have a great 50 or so minutes talking between them, and then we'll, we'll speak about how to do the Q&A once it starts then. Thank you all very much, and I'll see you a bit later. Bye. Ian, is it just me who thinks Jonathan should probably stick to that, that kind of intro in the dark with a with a light i think it's, I, I think it's a it's a marvelous improvement <laughs> yes. um, as so often um a negation proves to be extremely positive i agree <laughs> what better introduction to a, a session on imagination indeed indeed so, so yeah oh, you carry ahead. on no no i'd <laughs> like you to fire away Okay, so I mean, I wanted to just start by um, by saying that it's not an exaggeration to say that it's a huge honor to have this conversation. Um, and just to say a big thank you for your work, um, you know, on, on reading 
uh, the master and his emissary and also you know the the two huge tomes which I've got here on my desk the two latest books <laughs> massive I've been using it as a laptop stand but also really amazing <laughs> really fantastic <laughs> incredible but really grateful because I, as I have been reading your work what I have been finding is that there is a resonance to the work that goes beyond just the content there's a sort of grammar of meaning um, and it kind of reminded me of the conversation you and Zach were having about, you know, how meaning and value are, are so inherent in the universe. And I really had this sense as I mm. read, had this sense as I read your book that um, there is something resonating in your work that is much deeper than the the left hemispheric kind of, oh, that's an interesting fact. And, oh, that's a great quote. And that's a fantastic bit of research. There is something going on <laughs> at, at a deeper level, um, which perhaps also has something to do with um, identity. Because actually as a scientist, as somebody who started life in the sciences and felt profoundly um, dissatisfied by the kind of scientific route to truth um, and, and you know, really felt that the sciences as a whole were just quite impoverished as a way to understand reality. Um, as I'm reading your books, I'm feeling like, you know, you've done me and probably many others a huge favor to give us a, a stack of kind of um, research and backing for what that feeling is, the feeling of like, this can't be all there is, there must be more. Um, and, you know, I found my way from science, you know, how long ago was it? About seven years ago, I left the lab at Imperial College London, finally kind of said, okay, I love science, but there's something more. And actually, if we want to try and address what's wrong with the world, clearly science and technology don't have the answers because we've been trying that route for the last 200 plus years. So there's something else. Um, and, you know, I found my way to imagination, which is obviously the topic of what we're going to focus on today. And I found it profoundly um, encouraging that, you know, the final chapter of your of the first volume of The Matter of Things is, is imagination. It kind of feels like you went on a similar path from questioning, you know, science as the only route, re science and reason as the only route to truth, um, to questioning, well, what, how are we unmaking the world, you know, through perception, through... Mm -hmm. Um, some kind of divorce from reality because clearly mm. there's something going on if if we're so out of touch with reality um, that we're creating the kind of destruction with, that we see today. Um, and I'll, I'll stop in a second, but one of the other things I found profoundly um, satisfying was that you also came to the same conclusion that imagination is not a faculty and a capacity that takes us away from the world. It's actually one that brings us closer to reality. And I feel like this is what I've been trying to say for the last kind of four or five years. When I started the work with moral imagination, I was saying, I think imagination can get us closer to what really matters and what is real. Um, but I felt like I was sounding like a crazy person. So <laughs> <laughs> that's where I want to start is just a big thank you, really. Um, and I'm curious to hear, you know, any, any thoughts you've got in response to that. Oh, that's that's a very kind uh, introduction. And there were so many things in what you said that I, I would love to um, uh, pick up on. Um, I mean, one one that just comes to mind is the the difficulty of articulating the really important things. And these are the things that don't therefore get um, adequate treatment in science and in the discourse of reason, both of which I honor hugely. Um, as I believe you do too, but I don't accept that they are the only ways of reaching reality or even necessarily the, the most profound ones, um, but they make a very, very valuable contribution. And I worry about the way in which sometimes nowadays people are too ready to disparage either science or reason. Mm. Um, so um, yes, but essentially it's going to defeat language <laughs> because what we're, what we're, what we're going for, what we're talking about when we're thinking about imagination is a resonance between ourselves and another, and that other isn't necessarily well specified, but is absolutely real. It may be 
the, the existence of a phenomenological world around us. It may be a realm in which the better ways to talk about ourselves are as um, embodied souls, but there is here something that language will always um, bring to the, to the ground with a great thud, <laughs> which is which is in no way um, does justice to what it is that we're talking about. So I do think that imagination is central, and that's why, in a way, I did work towards that at the end of part one and that section on epistemology. And, and you'll notice at the end of part two, which is the metaphysics, I. My, I have a chapter on the sense of the sacred, which is also another thing that you, you know, you know from the very word go, it's going to defeat language. But we mustn't be put off by that. We must stick to our perceptions, and you can have perceptions and you can have insights without them necessarily having to be explicit in language. In fact, all the best ones are not. Which is why we have poetry, why we have music, why we have ritual, why we have narratives, myths, all these things are able to put us in touch with things that importantly need to remain implicit unless they're going to be degraded by this, the common coin of um, everyday language, which makes everything similar to something else that we already know. So what are we going to do about the realm where we're going to find things that we don't already know? Because language only deals with the stuff that we do, unless it works against itself. And you may know that my first, book um, was called Against Criticism. I wrote it in my 20s. Oh, I didn't. And it, well, anyway, yes, it, 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 I think it was, um, it sold about 400 copies. And after that was unceremoniously remained it. Um, and Faber made a big loss on it. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, the idea there was to argue that there was something wrong with the way in which we conceived academic criticism, which was to take an entity that was living, entirely imaginative, implicit, embodied, and utterly unique, and turn it into something every day that was general in nature, decontextualized, disembodied, and from which the, the magic of imagination had disappeared. But there was another meaning to the title, which was that criticism could work if it worked against criticism. In other words, there is a kind of discourse which is aware of its own limitations and can incorporate them. There is a kind of science that can be aware of the limitations and therefore not become hubristic about what it can definitely state. And it's getting into that area where you've neither rubbished something nor said, this is our savior, this will give us all the, the story. There will never be the whole story, because I believe that whatever it is we're trying to contact is essentially infinite and also of infinite importance, which gives us a bit of a thing to think about during our lifetime, because we have a short period in which to make use of this amazing gift. So that, that's what I'd say in the outset anyway. Mm. How would you, what a would lot. you think about that? There's a lot, a lot there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good. I, the, some of the, so a metaphor, a couple of things. So um, the metaphor that I can't remember where it is in the book, but where you talk about um, the flat, maybe it's in a quote, the flashlight and the, the fertile dark. Yes. Biochemist who is talking about how. You know, uh, we, Erwin Chargaff. Yes. 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 Yes, and I loved that. So he was saying, you know, I think people think that science is about illuminating the darkness, but actually science need, needs this fertile darkness. And if you think that you're illuminating it, it's the, it's the kind of flashlight in the, in the void, you know, in the, the dark starry skies and, and, you know, kind of incredible, mystical, ineffable, you know, universe. And you've got this flashlight and you're saying, well, we found, we found it. It's this room here that we can see. Um, I thought that was yes. such good, such a great metaphor yes. for, for what we, what you know, what what the situation we're in. And then it also made me think about, um, obviously, as an imagination activist, you know, person, mm. ex, you know, uh, what was I say, obsessive. I've read quite a lot <laughs> of Blake, <laughs> William Blake. Ah, oh, wonderful. Who, yes. You know, his yes. work is huge, hugely. Um, not just inspirational, but like your work, the kind of work where I read his work and I think, ah, like, yes, this is this is resonating with what I'm finding in my practice and, you know, in the kind of lab of imagination where we're trying out 
practices and working with people and actually seeing some of you know what he's talking about in in kind of 1700 feeling like yes Yes. um and he i think there's a work of his art where he paints newton um you know he's painted isaac newton with this and he's like staring at this at this piece of paper which has got like a beautiful graph on it and then there's like the big chaotic mystical universe around him um but he's just you know he's focusing on this kind of perfect um you know perfect equations or you know some sort of representation of the world um and so that that's what comes up for me is that you know science is beautiful and and elegant and Mm. that the reason why I chose to study science and I loved it like I'm sure you did as well um but we think that we are discovering everything you know it's it's quite Mm. often that um that I hear people say like, oh, what if we run out of things to discover of the unit? You know, <laughs> science has covered so much. <laughs> and actually, what if we run out? Um, and I just, yeah. wow. wow, what an impoverished you, you, reality. You need imagination to see how little you know. <laughs> if you don't have any, you think we know it all. But exactly. yes, I'm so glad you brought up Blake, who, by the way, uh, um, you know, we, we both know that Blake was a wonderful man, also quite frustrating in some ways. And he did tend to, <laughs> yeah. for his own purposes, demonize Newton, who, you know, yeah. interestingly was was um, uh, more fascinated by spiritual um, inklings of yeah. his than he was by his physics. But, yeah. but it just goes to show that a great mind can, I believe, encompass both. And many of the great physicists of the last hundred years show that exactly, that they are able to see into the heart of things, matter, and see in there something beyond and more profound. And that that brings me back to Blake, and I hope this is a fruitful connection. I think the quote is, to the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. And mm. I think I used that at the beginning of the chapter. And yeah. what's really interesting about that, you can puzzle over it. What does he mean? The man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. Well, just before it, I quote Richard Feynman, who says that nature has a far, far greater imagination yeah. than a human being, which is really a way of saying our puny imagination can only get so far in investigating what there is. But I think mm-hmm. that Blake is making a more profound point. I mean, it's a very good point with which I entirely agree. But I think what Blake is saying is that with imagination, you are not inspecting a something over there, Mm. but in imagination, you are already in whatever it is, so that the subject-object divide is actually transcended. So that if you really look into nature, you are already in nature. And this is what imagination is about. It's about healing the divide not in Mm -hmm. some terribly weird and new agey way which means we can stop thinking but (laughs) but but there is something desperately profound in this idea that in the realm of imagination we are actually contacting not a representation which is what the left hemisphere uh, Mm -hmm. um, offers us not a drawing a picture a graph a theory but the actual experience of what it is in which we finally see sort of through it, but not in the sense of seeing through it to something that's separate from it beyond, but seeing through the veil of familiarity to its real core, you know? So I think that that's, that's one thing I'd like to say about imagination is that it, it brings us to this, this place. We're not sort of just making stuff up or we're definitely not making stuff up. In fact, that's the exact opposite of what we're doing. We're respectfully, honorably, humbly, with awe approaching whatever it is and thereby allowing ourselves for once to get close to it and into it. I'm so glad you said that. Um, There have been, you know, during the work of finding the thread of imagination and kind of pulling on it and starting to unravel, you know, a huge amount. Um, What I've been uncovering in my research and, and, you know, thinking and writing and practice is that imagination, I think, is one of the most deeply misunderstood things, Um, not non-things, actually, because I think one of the reasons it's been so misunderstood 
is because it's been so thingified. It's been so, you know, it's like, oh, the imagination, exactly. the thing that is over there that we do sometimes on the weekend and we have it when we are <laughs> children, but we don't have it when we're out, you know, and it's this ridiculous mm. kind of, even the language we use around imagination is completely, um, it's not just inaccurate, but it leads us into completely confused realms um, and, and creates quite an odd relationship between ourselves and imagination and this has been a lot of the work of the last few years is like actually before I even get to do the work of actually you know testing and experimenting with how can we increase you know increase imagination capacity which is also a bit of a, a an odd term um, because actually yeah. I, what I've been finding is that you there is no need to there's nothing to increase because it's not mm. a volume or a thing there is just unblocking mm. to be done from from the exactly. relationship to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can keep it's, going. Give it to you. We'll do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like I, I wish this was like a four-hour conversation because it's so good. Yeah, I to know. Uh, yeah. Unpack some of this. But, um, what I just wanted to comment about it now, yeah. since we've had a little hiatus, is um, the idea that imagination is not something that has somehow to be drummed up. Uh, exactly. It's something that is there all the time if our certain way of thinking doesn't get between us and it. So we use and have to use the left hemisphere's mode of apprehension in order to be able to function properly. But as I'm always saying, there's nothing wrong with that. There's something good about that. As long as we can then remember to go beyond it, to have finished that process of unpacking explicitly and then say, right, it's none of that, although that has actually helped us on the way. So it's as people say in so many religious traditions that the seeking of God is, is not that God is hiding somewhere, but God is there if only you don't stop yourself mm. from seeing. And that's, that could be said, I think, about the imagination, that it is there. And we, it's by not doing things and mm -hmm. by not espousing certain views and not acting and so on, but allowing, permitting something that it will come into being for us. Exactly. Um, and, and one of the things that the participants of you know, the programs that we're running with Moral Imagination say is that one of the most valuable things that we're doing when we go into local councils is giving them planned unplanned time and to start yes. with the the kind of managers were like what you know what what, what do you mean <laughs> unplanned yes. unplanned time but that's actually what it takes is to just mm. is you know how can we expect very good. To exercise imagination when there's mm. no space or time and we're completely flooded by the need to deliver to pr produce to perform Worst conditions for imagination exactly. ever. Like modern day. And those are all expressions of the left hemispheric mentality that we must have something we can measure. There must always be a, a utility. There must be a product to this. Otherwise, this has been completely wasted, even if the time that you spent was profoundly useful, but didn't actually turn up anything measurable at the time. Mm. So it's all this administration, mm. managerial thinking that in my view is mushrooming in the world. I mean, so fast that I think there's a very palpable difference between now and five years ago. I mean, it was bad all the time I was growing up. I complained about it in the 70s and the 80s, but I hadn't seen anything till you get to 2023, where, and I think this is partly to, to do with machines, which of course have no imagination, have no understanding of context, individuality, embodiedness, feeling, the spiritual, anything, but are following simple left hemisphere rules. So it's much worse. It's much worse than talking to an administrator is having to deal with a machine. And now most of the time when you want to do anything, you have to interface with the machine. So that is the death of imagination. And I'm sure you know Paul Kingsnorth uses the term the machine as I think yeah. it's a perfectly good way of talking about what I mean by the left hemisphere. All I'd say is that it's bigger than the machine. In the mm -hmm. machine is an expression of this left hemisphere mentality, but the left hemisphere mentality is behind 
the machine and behind many other things. So, for mm-hmm. example, we we look at various predicaments, the obviously the destruction of the planet, the 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 catastrophic changes in climate, all of these things. And we see them as something either bad luck or bad planning or something we did wrong. Um, and we and we look at other things like you know the the the, the the growing disparity, not the diminishing disparity between the um, unimaginably rich and the poor. And we think, well, we, we must have got a problem here. And what did we do? And there's all these different problems. What was the solution? And the answer is they're not problems, but in Dougal Hines terms, they're predicaments that we have brought about by a certain way of thinking, which leads inexorably to each of these mm-hmm. and to a despiritualized, desacralized sense of the world in which we live. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, so um, I'm just holding in mind, you know, there's a couple of things I'd like to cover in this conversation. So I'm, I'm just following the thread of where it's going, but I will pull us into a couple of things because I'd really like to spend By some all time. Means. Yeah, I'd love to spend some time on the brain and imagination neuroscience because that's something that, you know, I've done a lot of thinking and research around and, and would love to talk to you about, you know, linking it with the right, right and left um, hemisphere and also um, talking about moral imagination, which was my way into yeah. imagination. We must talk about both of those. Yes, we must. Yes, um, I did just want yes. to kind of, you know, hat tip to Chat GPT because you mentioned, you know, machines don't have imagination, and I'm sure that it's on mm. everybody's mind. As you know, right mm. now there is a a lot of talk about how Chat GPT seems to have imagination. You know, it's it's mm. kind of churning out poems and um, rap mm. battles and. Um, you know, and seems to be creative, even though it's, you know, through a mimicry of all the in- information, mm. you know, kind of emergent property of all the information it's gathering and kind of yes. inferring mm. off. But, you know, do you want to say anything about? Um, oh, gosh, I do. Yes, because, I mean, I, I, I want to say that I can't intellectually completely rule out that at some point, some creation of ours might might achieve a kind of consciousness. I, I, I just can't rule that out, partly because I believe that consciousness is the original primary stuff of the cosmos in any case. Um, but what you mean there and what I mean by imagination is not what this is doing. What it is doing is exactly what an, an imaginative person doesn't do, which is do a very quick, which of course a human being couldn't do in the sp- speed. What machines do is just do things very fast, is to sort of do um, a trolley dash around um, Wikipedia and come up with, with an answer. And it will even make stuff up and be quite sure that it's right because it sees a pattern and jumps to conclusions, which is what the left hemisphere does. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and really, this is no different from something that existed, oh, decades ago. I can't remember the name of the man, but basically what he did was he fed all of Bach's works into a computer and then set some sort of, you know, let the computer look at these things and then imitate a work of Bach. But none of these works has anything like the power of Bach. And Bach's very first composition, when he was 19 years old, is already one of the most staggering pieces of musical writing in history. And it wasn't derived from anywhere. So we're looking at things that we must be careful, you know, because a machine can be made by human ingenuity to simulate almost anything. I mean, Mm. there's no limit to how far you can help it simulate. The question is, is it simulating something or is it actually achieving it? And so far, there's no evidence that it's achieving it. Mm. And is there also something about, you know, it, again, it's almost like a, a left hemisphere response to art or to the sacred. It's like, oh, but, you know, we could just churn out, you know, does the sacredness of art become affected yes. if it's just something that's being churned out through random, you know, re organization of of you know fact and um and existing art i mean that i think we could talk for the whole hour just about this but i did just want to you know to touch on it so really, it's relevant well really it's it's really the 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 logical conclusion of the industrial revolution which was to take things um that took a lot of craftsmanship and or you know occurred in nature and try and imitate them and then produce thousands of them very very fast it's exactly what was going on already in the early 
part of the 19th century. It, it's just um, been heightened to, a, to another level of technological sophistication. Mm. But it's, it's, it's not going to produce, uh, it's never going to produce works that have profound human meaning because you have to have a body, emotions, the sense of relationship, the knowledge that you're going to die, to have suffered, and to be aware of the limitations to what it is that you can experience. And I just think this is this can be this can be fed by a clever IT expert into a computer that seems to say those things, but it can't actually do them. Hmm. So back to imagine it the the organic yes. imagination. Yeah. Um, you know yeah. so. I said at the beginning that I felt it was one of the most deeply misunderstood and we yes, you know, yes. about the thingifying of imagination. You know, I also, in your you know, chapter 19 um, of your book, you talk about how, I guess the, the parallel is that um, many people, when they think of imagination, think of fantasy, think of, you know, daydreaming. And this is often what I get um, when I talk to people about what I do it's like oh oh yeah you know we need more imagination we need more fiction you know we need more yeah, creativity yeah, yeah. another another big misconception I've um, been fighting is that people think that my work is all about the future it's not about the future mm -hmm. it's about mm -hmm. it's not it's not about time in fact I actually think in, in, in the imaginative imaginal realm there is no time it's not a time bound place um, and so that's been quite an interesting thing to unpack is that people immediately think that what I'm doing is helping people imagine the future. Um, when actually the work of moral imaginations is really about shifting perspective and unblocking and seeing what is there. So it's it's not, we're not trying to get people to think about the future. Um, you're about, were you about to come in there? No, it's very interesting because, I mean, you know that, um, um, you sent me some things to look at about an hour before this, and I ha therefore didn't have time to look at them in any depth. But I was interested by your three pillars, which would seem on the face of it to suggest that you are interested in the past and the future, as well as our relationships with the natural world. I like that, actually, because I think that one thing we've lost is the sense that we are, it's part of our atomistic way of thinking, um, it, we are part of a flow which includes the past and includes the future and our ancestors and any of our um, offspring are already present in our lives in some way and we owe them each a moral obligation. We have a moral obligation to those who, who, who worked hard, sacrificed, died to produce the things that we take for granted. And all the wisdom that they stored up, which is now just being trashed and thrown out of the window. And we have a, 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 we have a, a, a moral obligation, a very big one, to those that come after us, not to carry on um, defiling and destroying what is their um, birthright. So I, I like that. I, but maybe what you're saying is that in the realm of imagination, there is no time. I wouldn't know, really whether there was or not. But I think that when you're really in the realm of imagination, you're not aware of time. You're not aware of time passing. So that when you make contact, after all, imagination is not only not a thing, it's a relationship. And that relationship is reverberative. So something is going on that is bringing something into being. And this is why you have to do the kind of one foot in, in, in either camp of saying, it's not just something I make up. But it's not something just out there given. It's something that comes into being that is utterly real. An aspect of what it is is revealed in the relationship with my imagination. And so we're dealing there with something that is the only hope we have of getting into reality. Because if we just look, as Wordsworth and Coleridge, they have the, great, <laughs> the greatest ph philosophical writers on imagination in any language, I believe. Um, but I mean, what they were saying is that when we think we see something, we look at the mountain and we just see a lump of rock and so on. But it's only when we use our imagination that we see into it. And in doing so, we don't see something that's other than a lump of rock. We see what a lump of rock is, that lump of rock is, by the way, not any, that lump of rock is for the first time. And this reminds me of um, you know, the Zen master Dogen in the 12th century, who said, when I 
sought enlightenment, the mountains were just mountains and the rivers were just rivers. When I was in the process of seeking enlightenment, the mountains were no longer mountains, the rivers were no longer rivers. When mm -hmm. I achieved enlightenment, the mountains were mountains and the rivers were rivers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point, is we're not putting something in place of something. We're allowing the real entity for the first time to become real in this world. And we each, to link to moral, imagination. The reason I believe that attention is moral is because the way we attend changes what it is we find. And what we find is part of the imaginative world that is the only thing that is real. And so we are actually creating something, either something terrible or something good by what we do. And that, that means that we each bear the burden of a certain kind of responsibility for what we do. Mm. Blake talks about twofold vision, which I think yes. is very relevant here. Um, and I love the, you know, his couplets of, oh, oh God, may, may us keep um, from single vision Newton's sleep. And, you know, yes. I love that because yes. it, you know, what he talked about yes. was actually the, the view of the world is just material. That's Newton's sleep, yes. you know, dulling you into a sleep away from yeah. reality, which you actually... Yes reveal through twofold vision meaning one eye yes. and you know looking yes. externally and seeing what is but the other eye having this internal mind's eye of imagination and that is the twofold vision of what is real yes. and we've been lulled into a sleep you know by I, I, he clearly has an issue with Newton, but he also depicts Newton as like a beautiful, healthy god. Yes. So I don't think it was only that, <laughs> but poor Newton, no, no. it's not only him. And as you say, he also had a great interest in the mystical and the mysterious. Um, yes. I, I loved that, that kind of, you know, this is lulling us into a dangerous sleep, which we might yes. not wake up from before it's yes. too late. And that's why this yes. work is so urgent and so existential, actually. Um, because actually we, we're asleep at the wheel and we're heading towards a cliff. Um, and and I, actually, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I, and I did that imagination can can wake us up. I, I, it needs to because as I as I say in in one of the books I don't know that we're like somnambulists wandering towards the abyss, humming a happy tune as we go, and that's the left hemisphere. It doesn't see what's happening, and yet it thinks all is fine because I know and I'm in control. Mm. Mm. So we need to see. I think Blake also said that you know that the man of imagination sees not with the eye but through the eye, and yes. again it gives this idea of a depth to what one's seeing, but yeah. that. What one shouldn't think is that what one sees through the eye is some hidden reality behind what it is. One sees into the depths of things, as words were said. This, this is a very, very important idea that he, in fact, he talks about lulling our intellectual, words were talked about in the Tintin Abbey Road, about lulling our intellectual faculties asleep so that the, that we can see into the depths of things. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a kind of sleep of reason, which <laughs> is either what, um, what Goya thought was terrible, and I know what he was talking about, because it's happening in our own time when people um, just decide that they're going to dispense with reason because it doesn't accord with what they want to believe, so they'll just believe it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is a sleep of reason, but there's sometimes a need to silence the hemisphere that does all the processing of language so that the other hemisphere, the right hemisphere, can for once see the whole of that. Mm. Which, is act, which, which is actually what happens during sleep, you know, and which, which gives rise to dreams, isn't it? That the kind of dominant, I've been, you know, my, my research has led me to the default mode network, which I don't know if that yeah. is left hemispheric, you know, dominant network, because it's, it seems to be the seat of rationality, reason, also the sense of self, we don't, you know, when we're born, we don't have a default mode network. So as babies, we, we don't have memories, because the default mode network is what gives us that autobiographical sense of self. Um, but it's also, yes. it's also what constrains the imagination. So as children, we have imaginary friends, and those imaginary friends are not close our eyes and somewhere over there they're here with us they're you know people mm. see children mm. talking to their imagine imaginary friend because it's yes, yes. it's there 
Um, yes. And so, you know, interesting that the that the default mode network becomes stronger and stronger, you know, into adulthood. Um, and I think it was either Blake or somebody writing about Blake talked about how compared adulthood to the falling out of Eden, you know, the kind of innocent childlike wonder and awe um, and imagination that we have. Um, and then as sure. we get older, there's a kind of divorce from that and the the strengthening of these networks and also our culture and society that is constantly strengthening the neural pathways um you know of reason of rationality of modeling predicting controlling um and it's interesting that often when people go through our workshops they talk about rekindling or reconnecting with a kind of inner sense of childlike wonder or you know some, someone's even said like I, f I feel mm. like I've discovered the five-year-old you know that was kind of yes. asleep inside yeah. me which sound, sounds a bit contrived or you know a bit silly but there's something interesting yeah. going on that people are finding a reconnection to a childlike yes. wonder which which has a huge pain you know that they feel a great sense of grief that that's been lost um yes. and and this is all connected you know the your work of the, the kind of dominant yeah. rationality reason anyway that's a jumble of of thoughts no no yes as that well no um of course there are different kinds of imagination there's the imagination of a michelangelo or a bach and there's the imagination of a um a thoughtful lively five-year-old um, and there's a, in a way, there's a sort of parallel to the way in which there is a kind of um, knowing um, which gets in the way of unknowing. I mean, it's not the same as the unknowing you have when you're ignorant and still have to learn. It's the unknowing that, in fact, goes beyond knowing when you know enough to know that you have to practice unknowing. Similarly, there's a kind of innocence a child has, which is as it were, a gift that they have. But there is a kind of innocence that a saint has that comes the other side of experience and is greater than either the innocence or experience. And so I would say that there is a kind of sense of imagination. The imagination can grow. It doesn't have to be stunted by life. But the processes whereby we educate people can certainly contribute to a process of, you know, making them feel small and making them feel silly if they confess to imaginative ideas, such as, you know, an imaginative friend. And then somebody says, now, don't be so silly. There isn't really anyone there and so on. And, and, and of course, this, this links to bigger topics like, um, amongst other people, um, poor old Dawkins, he's become like Newton for Blake, but he just keeps on saying these things. He, he sort of believes he it's it terrible. That that <laughs> He's his own worst foe. So how dare people indoctrinate children into these ideas of a spiritual realm and a divine realm? So they'd never think of this if they weren't in indoctrinated into it. But actually, there's, there's a lot of research, some of which I quote in that book, which shows that children naturally are aware of things beyond what we call the realm of the five senses. Mm. But that this is kind of um, drummed out of them by being told it's wrong and humiliating them. And then they go, oh, well, and they're lucky if they can then reconnect with it. And of course, what in my experience certainly helps to reconnect one with that is the greatness of art in all its various forms and the experience of what everyone likes to call it religious or spiritual life. Mm. And nature. Yeah, as we and nature is core to all of this yeah. yes absolutely yes so into moral imagination because i um right. this is really you know i find imagination is absolutely fascinating and it's uh to me it's you know the most convincing route towards um getting us out of this mess you know i, right. I yeah existential crisis as many people do in their 20s and really felt like you know what are we doing to the world and and it, that crisis has essentially led me to imagination but through the, that crisis you know the question I was really asking was like how is it that we're making such immoral decisions how is it that we are making decisions that are so self-serving so greedy um, you know, what is that about? How, how how does that come about? So I became really fascinated by morality and ethics 
you know, and thinking mm. probably with with a hangover of my scientific you know brain thinking like mm. okay so the problem is a lack of morality or you know a lack of the sacred or some sort of death of what is good beautiful and true so how what can mm. we do about that started reading about you know, morality and 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 didn't find a lot of it very interesting um, and then came across you know came across you know the, the thing i was thinking about was that actually the way that we've approached morality in the west has a lot of parallels to the way that we approached you know science that it's very much tangled up in reason in rationality and and you know the kind of enlightenment breeds of morality like utilitarianism or kantianism feel like they're very much left brain um schools of of morality and thought and you know kantianism suffers from extreme abstract you know abstraction utilitarianism suffers from extreme reductionism um and so i started wondering what what would mor morality with um a, a kind of upswell of imagination like where where could those two things you know, come together um and i think it's interesting that a lot of western morality is based on you know this is a very simple model um that, that mark johnson talks about the the kind of moral um moral folklore so a, a very basic model of the mind um having you know four four components you could think of it as perception uh will um you know the mental realm it's got for, let's say it's got for these four members perception reason passion and will and the way this works is, you know, perception receives sense impressions from the body, passes them to reason or passion. Um, and these two things affect our will um, and passions become active through bodily experience, um, you know, either directly through perception or through memory. Uh, reason receives this information and calculates and analyzes sense data and passes it to the will. And, um, you know, basically it's up to the will to decide how to act. Um, based on these two influences. And so, um, you know, as I said, reason calculates, passion exerts force on the will. And we think of passion as kind of unpredictable, difficult to control. Um, reason, you know, exerts force on the will, but the will, will can sometimes resist reason. Um, it can't resist, you know, it can sometimes resist the force of passion. So there's something here about you know that the a model of morality being the ability to use reason to make the right decision and to resist the force of passion and we also think of animals as as lacking reason and so humans being these um you know like a, a reason a rational animal or a reasonable animal um but but the role of imagination doesn't doesn't play any role here at all um and to be a moral to be moral um, in this folk uh, model of morality is to exert reason um, and is is to resist the force of passion. Are, are you am I are you with me on this or you know is there anything to? No, no I am. Um, I am broadly with you. Um, what I'm thinking though here is that um, as you're well aware, there are different. Um, schools of thought about morality and very mm. different approaches to religion and the religious life and like everything else the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have different takes on them and what you're pointing to is what joins together all these various things the excesses of capitalism of rationalism of mechanism and so on is that these are expressions of the will for power which is essentially the only value, as I've said before on previous uh, occasions, the only value that really drives the left hemisphere. It, it's evolved to be the one that manipulates. Mm. And that leaves all the other values that are to you and me, and I think to all human beings, so important and are so neglected. It leaves them out of the picture and out of the calculation. And I, I would say that, you know, and for all that Kant was a bit autistic and, and hyper-rationalistic in some ways, and he did say, you know, the two things that 
that fill me with awe, the, the starry vault above me and the moral law within me. So, I mean, he was in awe of the fact that there was a morality at all. And indeed, he, he thought that there must be a God because there was morality. He didn't think there must be morality because there was a God. So he thought that this moral thing was actually very important and intuitive, although his particular approach to it, I slightly different from. But one of the things that one now sees in the way we talk about morality is exactly what you were getting at, that it seems to be about um, a logical process that will result in the utility and maximize utility. And I don't want to recap on this because I think I talked about it probably. You did. With, um, yeah, I think you covered it yeah. in that conversation. With Zach, exactly. But there is a huge problem with this approach and that what it rules out, as you also are hinting, is the depth and importance of our intuitive imagination, which yeah. helps us to be human. And we, I think we're just becoming less than human because of the assault on all sides on intuition and imagination and the substitution of an incredibly mediocre thing, which is a rationalizing system. And I, I'm not saying that there is no virtue in having such a way of thinking. At certain stages in any kind of process, you need it. I keep re reiterating that because I, you know, I don't want to fall into this thing. People think, oh, yeah, the right hemisphere is all creative and wonderful. And the left hemisphere is this bogeyman. The left hemisphere is very, very useful, but it doesn't know its own limitations. And that is the problem we now find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I feel rather like I've just read, actually, and very much admire um, Dougal Hines' latest book. He just came and visited yeah. on the day that it came out a week or two ago. And, and we were in conversation um, the week after. Dougal and I. So oh, and I read right. his book. Oh, oh, wonderful. And yeah. uh, I don't, don't have much time these days for reading, but I started reading and thought, I think I'm going to have to finish this. And uh, I thought it was brilliant. But really what he's saying is, you know, very much this thing that there just aren't a you know, a, a, a sort of wicked network of there's this problem and that problem and the other problem. But there is a whole way of thinking that underlies very clearly the whole package. And it's no good just addressing it at the top level. That would be like putting a sticking plaster on a cancer. You've covered it, but it's going to keep growing. What we have to do is to emphasize that the only way out of this is to rethink our moral stance. And what I mean by that is to embrace above all a degree of humility about what it is that we as humans can do, to therefore listen to the wisdom that comes through silence and through traditions and through art and through nature, if you attend to it, and to express compassion and moderation in the way in which we try to deal with these i don't mean moderation in the sense of you know uh, averaging everything out but i mean not supposing that this one thing if we just do this we'll answer everything and being extreme about it we mm. we have to know that there are people who have differing angles on this and they can contribute something and so what you the work you're doing which is to liberate people's imaginations from whatever it is that they're constantly being told they have to believe is wonderful because it will bring different facets of truth to life mm, thank you i i also I'm, i mean i mean a really important part of the work is also the connection to what matters you know this moral mm. imagination the way i see that is that rather than following moral laws and rules that can actually be you know massively manipulated religion you know can can be be wonderful it can also be very harmful absolutely looking to kind of top down morality and morality has become a really dirty word you know but a lot of people have raised their eyebrows at the name of um moral imaginations and what we're doing and yet we're trying to reclaim that and say actually mm. what we need what everybody needs is to is to kind of build a muscle mm. of moral imagination mm. and metaphor and mm. the ability to really connect with what you know matters and is beautiful and good and true and mm. not wait to be told that or to follow rules or to try and work out what the right law or rule or principle is but to get this kind of coming alive through the imagination through you know through the the kind of faculties that we're talking about the kind of right hemispheric intuitive imaginative um 
capacities to to develop that compass of what is right and wrong and what are we not going to let happen does that does that make sense there's a kind of what i'm trying to do is knit them together i love that i love that and i think you ought to wear the superciliousness of these people who um raise an eyebrow when you talk about morality as a as a badge of pride it shows that you're really on to something important because nowadays everything that's really important is being attacked and destroyed because it demands of us some degree of self-restraint it, de it demands that we are aware of the limitations and boundaries in things we can't just have everything we want and have it now um we need actually to exercise some some virtuous restraint on how we behave and how we think and without it we're utterly lost and it, it comes from an intuitive level what really interests me is that there's a couple of cases i refer to in the book uh, in which scientists uh, who are completely convinced of course that human beings are naturally um uh, competitive self-interested competitive green. and self-interested egotistical and so on and um, it set up experiments to show this and were honest enough to report that the answer showed the exact opposite that p people aren't normally naturally and you see this in children but they don't have to be taught it um, unless there's something very wrong with them i know <laughs> but, but but generally speaking you see this that they they love to help one another they love to be cooperative we are naturally generous and it's further thinking and ratiocination that leads us to be greedy and self-seeking and speak for our own interests rather than others so you know once again it's a case of the not being a predicament how on earth do we reverse the way we are however do we it's actually there it's all there ready if we can just tear down the edifice that's been built in front of it if you see what I mean. Completely. And and the systemic, you know, we haven't really talked much about, you know, the systemic um, forces that keep us in, you know, that really encourage the kind of qualities you're let's, talking about. Let's do so. I, I, <laughs> capital, you know, <laughs> well, where, what's capitalism, your, yeah. capitalism, you know, what do you, I haven't, didn't see capitalism uh, mentioned so much explicitly in, in your book, but I'd be really curious to hear, you know, where, where, where the place for the kind of systemic critique of where we find ourselves is. Well, I suppose the thing about capitalism is that in, in a, in a, in a word, um, it's a product of the left hemisphere. It's, it, however, um, people will say, well, what would you like to put in its place? And I certainly wouldn't want to put communism in its place. Um, but there are other alternatives we could talk about based on it would take that to, to reach a kind of more communitarian way of living would require probably some some disaster i hope doesn't occur but which would sufficiently disrupt the structures we have now and people would be thrown back on having to help one another, trust one another, work together and so on. Because at the moment, we've become lazy. Um, so to go back to capitalism, I think that there are ways of thinking of capitalism in which it's tempered by other things. And so anything that is um, dogmatic is going to be inhuman and damaging. And so whatever system you come up with it needs to be tempered it needs to be qualified whatever it is it's going to have to have those and that's not wrong that's just showing that you're taking into account various different things but i don't talk about it largely because i'm not myself particularly um involved in political thinking um and i i don't want to I'm more interested in the things behind politics than in the politics themselves. So I didn't want to start a big conversation about that, which would have been a whole other book, one mm. which I'm absolutely not equipped to write. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is an interesting question. What what could a, you know, imagining to imagine what is a right hemispheric si system? If, the, if capitalism is created by the left hemisphere, mm -hmm. What and I've thought thought this quite often when as I've read your work is um mm. you know we live in a society dominated by the left hemisphere in doctrine mm. and and mm. it's too far and it needs to swing back. But what would a society mm. look like if if it had if it was kind of swung too far the other way? Um, you know, just to 
Yes. I mean, if it swung too far the other way, it, it, I, I'm often asked, so what would a right hemisphere society look like? And I say, well, um, very moderate, because the thing about the right hemisphere is that it understands the need for the left hemisphere's contribution. I mean, the story of the master and the emissary, the master appointed the emissary. It's just the emissary now thinks it's the master. That's the problem. So um, the, the, there isn't really... Um, sorry, where were we? What were we talking about there? The, um, the right I just lost my thread. The right hemispheric system. What would that look like? And I, you know, oh yes, what would it look like? Yes, yes. But and we have had periods in history, I think, where um, they're, they're not what we would probably suggest to ourselves now. But were obviously m massively creative periods in which society flourished in the West. But they were fairly short lived. And the thing is that, that every civilization is fairly short lived. Um, and um, I can't remember the name of the guy now, but um, early 20th century um, writer who looked at 30 past civilizations and reckoned that, I mean, of course, it's not scientific to say when does it begin and when does it end, but a reasonable gestalt was that they tended to come up and then fade over about three to 400 years. That seems to be the normal pattern. And one way of thinking about that is um, in the terms of um, William Offals. I can never remember whether he's William or Patrick. One is his real name, the other is his pseudonym. Um, not a good pseudonym. P uh, Offals, O-P-H-U-L-S, who wrote um, Immoderate Greatness, which is a, a quote from Gibbon. But effectively, it's a very short book, only 80 pages long. All of you go out and buy it after this. It doesn't cost anything, and um, or much. Uh, and he gives us six reasons why civilizations always undermine themselves by overreaching themselves in various ways. And one way of thinking of that is that this um, self-satisfying thing of the left hemisphere takes over. But one fairly, I think we would all resonate with this, one um, image he has is that civilizations tend to go through phases. In the first phase, they require enormous levels of mutual trust, valor, self-sacrifice, courage, hard work, you know, honor, the building something valuable. And then when that's been built, as it were, the next wave comes along and they can build on top of that and they produce works of science, they produce great works of art, they, they elaborate on top of this. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next wave, which is the final wave comes along, where they are basically now soft, weak, selfish, lack self-discipline, think that they're entitled to everything on a plate because they're born. And I believe this is the one we're in now. <laughs> we believe that somehow it's, it's our right to carry on living in a totally absurd way, which is destroying everything we value. That, thank you for answering that. And I know it seems as if we diverged from imagination, but I think a lot of what really brings people's imaginations alive at the moment is the question of what could an alternative look like? And, and also yes. the unimaginable, you know, I, I, that, that brings me a lot of um, hope, actually, the idea mm. that you know, all big social change or huge, you know, societal change was always unimaginable before it happened. And the, you know, 50 mm. years of the world we're living Very in true. now was completely mm. unimaginable. And so when people say exactly. where there is a there is an air of hopelessness and, and kind of despair and um you know mm. a, a darkness around you know what's coming next, there is a cliff edge. There thing. is, there is. So mm. I, I find it very uh, encouraging mm. to hear you kind of gesture at the unimaginable alternative well one of the points that um maybe we need to uh, start winding up our bit and hand okay. over but w one of the things in um in Dougal's book um is this um idea that the reason we're so despairing about what's coming is that we think too narrowly about ourselves mm. um and we and the life that we are living now probably won't exist in the future. And it didn't exist in the past either. But some creatures will live with any luck. I imagine substantial numbers of human beings will live and the world will begin to heal and regenerate. And what I hope is that those human beings will be 
will have their eyes opened to things that we're now blinded to by being too comfortable and too convinced that we know it all. And that that will lead them to, to a, a kind, humane, courageous working together in which people, you know, are bound together by the ties that really make life worth living. And, and, and it, it will be in smaller communities than the ones we have now. I mean, it's not a human faculty to be able to understand very large numbers, and especially not very large numbers of people. Is it 3 million or is it 3 billion or 3 trillion? We just don't know. But, you know, we're, we're, we're famously fitted to knowing about 150 people. That makes sense. And so I think one of the problems is we've simply agglomerated everything, and that's been partly due to technology and partly due to capitalism anyway maybe that's where we is that where we begin to we we'll have to have another one of these this is great <laughs> i hope it's just the first thank you <laughs> no, thank you very much phoebe thank you thank you both phoebe and ian um that was really really interesting and i thoroughly enjoyed the whole arc of the conversation so I'm looking forward to hearing the various questions that have that will be coming through shortly. And I should say that Jonathan has encountered uh, further difficulties with the power where he is. So I'll be conveying the questions and, and moderating this next okay. part. So I'm actually going to start by asking the question that Jonathan had hoped to ask if he were able to do it out loud. So I'm just going to read that out for you. And you have to imagine Jonathan's Scottish accent, which I unfortunately am not capable of reproducing and nor would you want me to. Um, so <laughs> Jonathan wrote, and he put this in the chat as well, but you'll have to scroll up a bit to see it. Um, Ian often suggests that the left hemisphere is power seeking in some sense, and both Phoebe and Ian suggest imagination may be critical to wake ourselves up to our predicament and be some part of the solution. And yet power in some shape or form will always be part of reality. So what then can we say about the relationship between imagination and power? And in particular, what might it mean to imagine power as something wisely wielded in a way that does not sound naive or wishful thinking? So I think this is actually quite mm. good as a follow-up to mm. Mm. the kind of systemic yes. discussion that you were just having at the end. Yes. So either of you who would like well. to. Um, Do you want to go first, Ian? Okay. Um, before saying anything, I see a number of people want to know about Du Gould Hines' book. It's called At Work in the Ruins. Um, and it has a very long subtitle, which is so long it's almost comical, and I can't remember it. Um, power. You see, there's a paradox that the more we seek power, the less we really have any control or influence over what happens, things control us. The power seeking mentality is always frustrated, always unhappy, always unfulfilled. And one sees this, I have seen it as a psychiatrist very often, but one sees it if one looks around. There is, and this is often said by people in particularly Eastern traditions, that what we're talking about is not a kind of helplessness, but a kind of affirming acknowledgement of one's vulnerability, of the fact that there are limitations, and that in all humility and honesty and with awe, one puts oneself open to something bigger than oneself. And that in doing that, one finds a new direction one finds that one is no longer frustrating oneself, one finds a freedom and autonomy, that by seeking freedom and autonomy in that aggressive left hemisphere way, we just destroy it. I mean, there never has been a period in, in, in the West when freedom has been more in jeopardy than it is now, unless one says, well, what about the Soviet era and the Nazi era? But we're going back into one of these areas right now because of a strident, unnuanced, naive view 
about freedom and um, and those sort of things. So that's what I'd say is that I, I don't think power is this simple thing about controlling others. It's about letting go of control in order to be filled with a spiritual sense of things, to be one with the world and therefore to, to, to be empowered by it. I mean, it is an empowering experience. I can say from my own poor, poor experience that I find it such. Mm. Yeah, th thank you for that, Ian. I, I think um, what I was struck by is that I I worry that we thingify power like we thingify imagination, like and and power is not a thing that we try, you know, that we're trying to get and grab and you know achieve. There's no end to it. That it, it's a kind of, as as you say, Ian. It's a kind of bottomless um, pit of like that you can never really reach the end of it. Um, I also, you know, not another thing that comes to mind is that I, I think, you know, the systems thinking, which I think is very right hemisphere, um, sis, the kind of systems thinking view on power yes. is not like the physics kind of put cause and effect. Like, you know, I push the world, I push someone and they fall, you know, right, that kind of mechanistic view on the world exactly. of power. So, you know, yes. that kind of model would mean you know, if, if the way power is, is exerted is through kind of pushing on the world and things happening, then the way to kind of get power is to barricade yourself from being pushed and to kind of get more and more powerful. But actually, we know through, you know, through systems thinking, through looking at how nature works, that pa it, mm. it, it doesn't work like that. It, it's not the only way it works. You know, power can also be not zero sum. There can be win-win. There can be different kinds of power where you win and I win and we and and you know everything there's a kind of mutual flourishing or a kind of a different kind of power that doesn't need to mean that other people get pushed down we could all be powerful so I wonder if that's you know that a different kind of power I I love that and I can't resist coming back uh, to it um thank you very much um because the thing about a complex system and all living things and all living communities and environments are complex is that they they don't have this um, efficient causation at the back of them that pushes things forward. Instead, there is uh, as much bottom down as top up causation, if you like to think of it in those ways, but there are also different kinds of causes. We've selected one of Aristotle's four causes the efficient cause and think that is what causation is. But in fact, people's behavior is caused also by aspirations towards certain things, by being drawn effortlessly towards something that is good, beautiful and true, what he called a final cause. And there are also formal causes which are becoming important in both biology and physics. Where is the information about form in that DNA code. Actually, there must be form fields, as physics suggests, so in biology. And this is now entering into the mainstream. It was a bit fringe, but it's now entering into the mainstream. So there are other ways of thinking about how things are caused, which are in the round and are beautiful and attractive, not being pushed from behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah beautiful. Botanical power. <laughs> Botanical power, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let's um, ask Stuart Campbell to ask the next question. So, Stuart, if you can, I will ask you, unmute you here, and if you can ask your question out loud, please. Yeah, thanks, Lee. So, um, I have a bit of a concern with the term imagination or idea of imagination that is it's kind of commonly conceived, and that is that human beings can imagine quite wildly and quite disconnectedly from reality. So my interest is in getting a clearer sense of how you discern imagination and maybe as differentiated for, from what. Um, in other words, how do we temper imagination or have imagination re relate fittingly to reality? I mean, we could say that the left hemisphere imagines itself the master so I, I if you get the tension that i'm trying to talk speak to here I, i'd love to hear what you have to say i certainly do see what you're talking about and of course imagination is not just some kind of um faulty thinking 
I'm, I'm tempted to, to refer to the saying, by their fruits you shall know them, that in a way you, you know imagination when you experience it and you know when you find it in others, that it is not a fantasy of theirs. Um, imagination can include dark things, but its general trend is towards life and vivification, whereas the appropriation of masterhood by the left hemisphere is a kind of blow for death, if you like, for, for mechanism. So there isn't, a, of course, unfortunately, a way we can measure in any sense imagination. And of course, we can't image it on a, on a, on a wretched PET scan or anything like that. We're talking about something which is profoundly and only experiential. And so um, imagination can um, lead people astray. This, this is right. But I think it's rather like being in the groove that you know when your imagination is taking you somewhere good. If you uh, have ever had, which I only very occasionally have had, the experience of really writing a poem rather than just versifying, you kind of know when something is happening through you. And I think that imagination is like that. It's rather like playing music well, singing well, or dancing well. That's the best I can say. It's completely, it won't stand up in a court of law, but it's, <laughs> it's the best I can do. Uh, help me out, Phoebe. I'm sure you've got something better to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got an easy out, which is moral imagination, obviously, because it, you know, what I like to say is um, that, you know, imagination gave rise to nuclear weapons. You know, imagination is not it's not, a, but it, it's not necessarily positive, but I resonate with what you're saying Ian, which is that there is, you know, we're talking about a kind of opening the doors of perception and allowing the sacred to flow through and exactly. you know, imagination being the kind of seeing through um, and allowing, you know, that real sense of connection to the world or, or experience of reality. Um, whereas what I think, Stuart, you were talking about is more kind of almost like active imagination, actively imagining things um and yes it can obviously lead to bad things and good things and a kind of directed um imagination and um, i i don't think that stands up in a court of law either but i i think it's a, <laughs> i think it's a good question i think there's also something about imagination yes. not being just a head you know head-based mm. thing it's also heart it's also embodied and it's mm. it's throughout mm. and how do we bring alive the that imagination that that you know that is not just using using the neurons of the head, but the neurons of the gut and the heart, and and there's so much more there. Um, I hope that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I I think also, well, maybe we've we've had enough on this question, but um, you know, um, w when people want to be imaginative, and I'm sure you, this is nothing to do with anything you do, but you know, they say, come on, let's have a a brainstorming session, you know, and you know, by bet noir, it's a brainstorming session. Doesn't matter how crazy it is, we put it on the board and so on and let it all hang out. This is not actually how creativity works. And I make a big distinction. I have a whole chapter separate to the imagination on creativity, because I'm talking really about how the brain, it can be helped in this. And it, it, it is nothing to do with this um, un, uh, uh, simply letting it all hang out. That That is not likely to end up with anything very useful. And when you look at people who are truly creative, they operate in a completely different way from the person who is trying to be creative. If you're not creative, then don't worry, you're not a creative person for now. Maybe later you will be. But right now, you're not a creative person. But don't try to be creative because it's counterproductive. Do not I try. Do. I feel like that's a kind of Yoda. There's a Yoda quote there. Don't try, just do. Um, oh, right, right, okay. <laughs> it's just, it's my life has been Yoda, Yoda poor, I'm afraid, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the interruption there. I was just going to say it actually is quite a good um, segue into the next question, which is from uh, Rosalind Murray. So I've just... Um, um, unmuted you, Rosalind. If you'd like to ask your question live, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was just interested in, well, you know, William Blake is great, but he passed away in 1827. So I'm just kind of wondering if you can speak to contemporary art ideas and imagination. I mean, there's a whole world in contemporary art 
that touches on all the things you're speaking about. It's a huge area. Um, at a lot of talks like this, and many others maybe that come from a literature side, often you're getting conversation that relates to artists that are very long ago mm. and not about what's going on now. And this is a huge area which already is exploring what you're talking about. So I'm just all of the things you're talking about, but kind of gets left out of the conversation. So I'm just wondering, is there any space within that that influences your work, but from a much more contemporary perspective? Who, who is that aimed at both of us? Um, yes, also, yeah, that'd be you're great. <laughs> you're still there. I'd like. I would also love to hear. You know, the artists. You, you that really. You know, I feel like there are some artists that perhaps you're holding um, here dear to to imagination. If there's any that you'd like to name before I yeah speak about before we speak about our own. I would. You know, I wouldn't because there's so many artists from so many cultures that if I started to even dig into yes. specific artists, specific approaches, um, you know, and even that brings me back to this question, another aspect of the question, which tonight and often this idea of we, like there is no one single we, we is a conglomerate. So I'm kind of mm. interested in the positioning of us, we, because we are not. And so even when we say we as a group of people, act in this way with imagination that's not true because there's a whole group of people who are maybe artists or naturally creative or have invested a huge amount of time in a particular practice of art and art understanding and learning creativity and imagination you know developing that that are not operating in that we and then there are people in other cultures don't that don't operate in that we so i think i wouldn't like to pick specific people because there's so much writing and so many people I'd just be interested in if you had anything from a more contemporary place that you were coming with yourselves so however you don't want to answer the question but you're asking us to answer it that's absolutely fine and um, the reason that Blake well, came no, I don't up think I think that's it... fair I don't think that's fair well, no no I'm not okay I'm not... Not, that's not a fair response Ian <laughs> okay not fair because well, you're it, it sounds like it. Give you, I'm just asking, does contemporary art influence your thought and practice in this area? Maybe there, that's a better way. The it. reason the reason that Blake came up, I think, was twofold. One is that he's a he's very unusual in that he writes about imagination all the time. He not only uses imagination, but he rather unusually writes about it. Most great poets don't. Wordsworth, perhaps, was another. Um, and possibly Coleridge, but it's not very common. I mean, the other is that he is a towering genius. I mean, he there's nobody like him in the history of, of, of literature. He's utterly unique and incredibly important. And the fact that he died in 1827 has no nothing whatever to do with it. If he died in 1827 BC, he would be worth exactly as much as if he were alive now, because as Phoebe says, there is no time in the realm of true imagination. These are timeless works, timeless truths. But if you ask me to say, what poets do I like? What painters do I like? And so on. I, I I can say that. I mean, one of the things that often happens when I'm giving a talk is that I have a painting behind me by Ross Loveday, which I think is a perfect expression of the modern imagination in that it is, it is a kind of absolutely non-pin-downable landscape. And it's also a fantastic abstract that seems to mean something beyond whatever landscape is being hinted at. So that would be an example of modern work, which is deeply imaginative. And it's not trying to um give me a message i mean it's death to a work of art when it's got a message and there's a little plot behind it. what the artist was trying to do with you know or what the composer really meant or no great art speaks for itself and is not trying to persuade you of anything that's what i'd say mm. but apologies if i offended this the, the the question i i was being a bit frivolous I mean, you have to take that as part of the game <laughs> anyway um over to you phoebe <laughs> um so rather than naming um, specific artists or, or musicians, but I might end up doing that. But I think what the question um, 
what what it brought up for me, which I think is a very relevant and interesting one, is the kind of movement ecology around imagination. You know, what who who who's there? And I, I speak about something um called imagination justice, which is actually who gets to imagine, you know, who where is the imagination capital in the world? Like at the moment, it's being hoarded by usually kind of tech CEOs in Silicon Valley who all look and sound a certain way and also have a lot of money you know and, and there's a there's a thing around who gets to imagine um, which is also not just um, who gets to imagine but whose imaginations get to then translate into you know affecting and creating and uh, worlding you know this concept of worlding from um, f- I think from feminist critical theory is about how some people get you know it, it get to create the world um you know and and as um now I think I'm going to forget who who said this but it matters who worlds worlds um it's a very famous quote by uh a writer who does influence me a lot in imagination I'm having a blank now um you know it matters what, what words words and worlds I'm glad worlds. it's not just me <laughs> yes <laughs> um it's staying yeah. staying with the trouble um is her book um anyway um but so I mean, something we didn't sorry just ian just to add that something we did no, no, no. far away thank you so much madalena um something we didn't come on to which i think is really relevant is that there are, there is a living you know living um group of people who indigenous people who whose whole culture you know who have been keeping alive a culture of imagination and and re, you know resisting not all again it's very easy exactly. to fall into generalizations and labels like not all indigenous people but mm. indigenous cultures I, I think really deserve a mention here because there is a a living breathing mm. continuum of a of a way of being in the world and principles you know principles ways of living relationship to the natural world so there is a stewarded culture um that is keeping imagination mm. alive in the ways that we've just been talking about Ian I'd, I'd love to hear you know if, if you have anything to say about that because I think it's very relevant to the no, question no, I just say a hundred percent agree I mean I resonated with everything you said and we're interestingly driving to extinction the little pockets of wisdom that we could be learning from and unfortunately mm. one very great pocket namely China has chosen instead of to offering wisdom that it once had has chosen to become um a, a, a delinquent western state but i i love what you say about the indigenous people and the wisdom that is there and it's very very important thank you um i'd like to invite mark reed to ask your question please and this might be the last one depending on um the response time just because we'd like to end it <laughs> 40 minutes after, as we've promised, the 100 minutes yes, yes. event. But let's yes. see. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank Phoebe and, and Ian, Michael Christ, Ian. I, I love your books. You're an incredible writer. And Phoebe, I, I, this is great to hear about you and, and the moral imagination. And my, my question is about the moral imagination. Uh, first of all, the, the first time I heard about the moral imagination was in a book by Rudolf Steiner, who I've, I've talked to Ian about before. It's oh. the philosophy of freedom. And there's the moral imagination we can see. But anyway, my question is, and we talked about, like you talked about developing the imagination. Uh, you know, do you either of you advocate any spiritual practices or do you do any spiritual practice yourself to develop the imagination? And uh, why well, I asked that question because you because you talk about moral development, Steiner talks about developing uh, the imagination, inspiration, and intuition. But he said, and every step in spiritual development should be uh, should be three steps in moral development. That's really important, and I think that's often what happens that people do do develop these. And actually, you know, this might sound crazy, but somebody like Trump, who is a uh, who is is a big fan of Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking, I mm. think has developed a great powers of imagination. Believe it or not, um, that and, and his will to power allied with that but no more development whatsoever. So I'm just curious about yourselves. Do you mm. uh, have spiritual practice to develop imagination? Over to you, Phoebe. <laughs> go, go ahead. Sure, You're the moral imagination person here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I, I um, it's interesting. I avoid the word spiritual usually. 
Um, I think there's a lot of baggage and I also think there's a huge amount of spiritual mm -hmm. bypassing that goes on. You know, the, the things that use the word mm -hmm. spiritual and are incredibly harmful and incredibly lacking in any kind of sense of the sacred or, or morality. So I, I stay away from that word. Um, I think the work that we're doing in moral imaginations, the work that Ian talked about, the three pillars of um, future generations, ancestors, and the more than human world is profoundly spiritual. Like I think part of why, I mean, I feel incredibly grateful um, and, and kind of honored to do this work every day is because it, I wouldn't call it that, you know, we're, we're going into local councils, we're working with, um, you know, large institutions, but what we are trying to do is create a space and practice that is profoundly connecting to the sacred. When you imagine having a conversation with a person seven generations in the future, you know, to, to touch on Iroquois uh, indigenous thinking, that is profoundly spiritual and sacred. So to me, this imagination work that I'm doing, it, it's it's not frivolous. It's not about the future. It's not about innovation and technology. It is deeply sacred and spiritual. Mm. And, you know, personally, you know, I, I meditate, I spent, try and spend a lot of time in nature. I think meditation, you know, that Rob Babea is a really interesting uh, Buddhist teacher who actually works a lot with imagination within the kind of Buddhist practice. So if anybody is interested, I'd recommend looking at his work. Um, but I think right now, the, I, I guess I only have so much capacity for spiritual work and, and basically my, my job is, um, doing that that kind of spiritual work and bringing people together and creating spaces where people can um connect with the with the imaginal with their sense of what's important what matters um and and so that's my that's my answer and, and Ian do you meditate I'm just curious yes I do um at least it's what I call meditation which is my understanding of mindfulness yeah um which I think is an important practice that should be taught in schools so that everyone knows how to do this mm. it's not it's not like there's some complicated technique it's just remembering to stop certain things happening and as i keep saying the first step in creativity sounds negative to the western mind because we think in these polar ways that it must be push 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 but sometimes actually you get if you're pushing at a doormat pull then you're doing the wrong thing and a lot of the time it's about stopping stopping doing the things that are going on in my head and remembering with gratitude the things that i do love and 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 learn from and feel connected to in in my day in my days i i'm lucky that i live well, by choice, in a rather remote place where I'm surrounded by nature, which is a constant companion and reminder. Um, like um, Phoebe, I dislike the word spiritual, which can be anything from having a scented bath with candles to, um, you know, I, I, I just don't, I think the term is terribly traduced. But yeah. on the other hand, people react very badly if you talk about religion for reasons I completely understand, although in the end I would... I would caution people not to dismiss by any means, crikey, the incredible traditions of the great religions of the world, um, including Buddhism, if you call it a religion, which I think a lot of Buddhists do, and quite rightly, because it's in touch with the divine. So I, I, what am I saying? I'm saying I don't I don't have, I don't actually sign up to anything. This is bad, I believe. I don't go to a church. Partly because any of the churches that are within striking distance for me would not be of the kind that I particularly want to go to. Um, and I would find it very difficult, I think. But I don't approve of that point of view. I approve of the point of view where you go and you you form part of a, a community. So I, I'm putting my hands up here um, as, you know, and I'm, I'm not, not, not any expert on any of this. I'm just like... I guess a lot of people listening to this, muddling my way through life as best I can, you know. And when I last checked, I was still alive, and that's good. Thanks. I, I expect the word spiritual. It's funny. I, I, I try, I'm trying to reclaim that word because I know it has a dirty, you know, association like religion, and and very much I, I was brought up, you know, hating religion as a Catholic because it was very moralistic. Um, in a bad way, in a, an exterior way.
but uh but it, it, yeah meditation mindfulness and that's what i meant really you know i suppose mm. yeah mm. look th thank you very much for your <laughs> can i loop back around because I, I just to say that i think there you know i said i i do meditate um but i think just really in parallel to the conversation we just had about imagination i think there's something about bringing you know, to me, being alive in the, you know, the Anthropocene, whether we use that word or not, but being alive in this time and being really awake and sensitive to what is going on is a spiritual, you know, it is spiritual. Like, I, I think that's kind of what you ended on, Ian, is like, I'm alive. I'm, you know, that is a spiritual experience. And <laughs> going and sitting and closing my eyes and meditating, I don't actually think of as more spiritual than the the kind mm. of con constantly waking up being like this is what's happening who am i what am i choosing to do how do no. i stay sensitive um to the the pain of the world to what is happening um i'm just saying that we are reaching to 100 100 minutes and i don't want to upset jonathan even though he's not here um by <laughs> taking us over um but I think it's a really good question it really got me thinking that there's a you know the answer i gave first and then there was a sort of emergency yes one and and what the hell about the timing? Sorry, I'm just going to say something. Um, the you know the, the idea that one should push towards a spiritual goal is also something that requires awareness of its negative side. So you know to be extremely Zen, you know the, um, the answer to being spiritual is to not try and be spiritual at all. You know, I, however, it's very good putting on my Western hat to have a routine of sitting down and perhaps reading a certain text or being quiet and meditative. There we are. <laughs> and somebody put a paradox mindset, but we haven't got time to talk about it, I suppose. I saw that. Yeah. I think I saw that. <laughs> There are so many good questions. Ian and Phoebe will send you the questions um, so that you have a chance to look good. at them. And, um, and for everyone, Thank you so much um, for being here. And for those of you that were asking questions and who wanted to ask that didn't have the time, please bring them to the connection session next Tuesday. And um, I also wanted to mention that in two weeks time, there's um, Isabella Granich, who's gonna be in conversation with Ian. Um, she's a researcher and facilitator. She works in kind of a, from a developmental science background, works with adolescents. Um, we'll have more information about who she is and the topic of the conversation very shortly. Michael's put it in the chat. So if you wanna um, register already for that next session. Um, and this will also go in a sort of modified form on YouTube once we make the edit. So um, if you wanna replay this, you'll be able to do that. And you'll see that link come out in a few days. But I think just for now, I wanted to really thank Phoebe and Ian for taking the time to speak together. I personally found it incredibly interesting to listen to the two of you in conversation. So thank you very much and good evening and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.